But um, the point is, is really simply that, that, you know, I would venture to say that nine out of the ten cases that reached the court are not really politically charged one way or the other. Now, you may say, well, that, right, it's the one out of ten that really matters. Uh, you know, the abortion cases, the cases involving religious liberty, the First Amendment cases, the cases involving campaign funding restrictions and things like that, those are the ones that matter. Um, and I, I would say yes to an extent, and then even then, though, you would need to look at individual justices. Uh, some justices do kind of vote with their ideology uh, in these cases. Uh, some of them are more open to persuasion. And, uh, and so I think the picture is, is a bit more complicated than it's sometimes um, portrayed uh, of, of necessity um, for um, public discourse. But nevertheless, uh, let me now turn to the Kavanaugh confirmation uh, process. Um, and I want to get a, a show of hands. How, how many of you watched any of the hearings uh, before the Judiciary Committee? So a couple of people aren't raising their hand. That's pretty interesting. Um, how many of you in the audience came to have an opinion about whether Justice Kavanaugh should be appointed or not? People in the peanut gallery up there. Um, how, many, how many of you would say you had pretty strong opinions about, about how the case should be? What, what is it about the nature of this process that, that causes us to have such strong feelings about it? I mean, I, I really don't know, and I'd be curious to hear your views on that. But certainly, all of my students had incredibly engrossed in the process, and there were opportunity for a lot of learning about. about you know what the Constitution has to say, and what the role of the Senate should be, and that kind of thing. But people almost invariably have very strong feelings, and they, and they come at it with um, strong opinions. And um, so, before I um, uh, talk more about it, I need to uh, sort of disclose my own um, bias, I guess I would have to say, or at least uh, prior interest, conflict of interest, I suppose. Um, I actually uh, worked with Brett Kavanaugh for a year. I mean, we were both at the Justice Department together. Um, he was actually a junior lawyer doing a, a kind of year sort of internship. Uh, I believe it was between his law school graduation and, uh, and his, his going on to a couple of um, clerkships, including one on the U.S. Supreme Court. So he was there in what we called a fellowship for one year, and we got to know each other, and we actually did some socializing. Um, and uh, so I came to know him as an individual. And, um, you know, so much of the issue of credibility has to do with our, it's shaped by our experiences, right? Our experiences of people, our experiences of life events, of bad things that have happened to us, of people we've known that remind us of the person who is in the public light. Um, so I came to have an opinion of him as, a, as an honest, upright person. And having formed that opinion, I, I kept that opinion. I ultimately found uh, that, that I nothing, as I told the press, um, to change my opinion of him as, as an honest person. But I'm aware um, that many people felt otherwise. And I think that um, probably at this point, the less uh, fruitful question than who was telling the truth um, is um, are some broader questions. And those, I think, will um, continue to have great importance going into the future. And um, the central question, I think, is uh, this one. What standard should the Senate have applied in assessing the allegations against Justice Kavanaugh? Um, this uh, became a pivotal issue, and it was one, among others, um, that uh, Senator Susan Collins addressed, who was a key senator um, in the voting on, on Justice Kavanaugh. She ended up uh, voting in favor of his confirmation. And it was, um, in significant part, with respect to the allegations of sexual misconduct and then lying about it during the hearings, because of the standard that she applied in, uh, in her judgment. And I want to read just a short excerpt from her speech to the Senate. It's a fascinating speech. Um, <clears throat> she said, now quoting Senator Collins, some argue that because this is a lifetime appointment to our highest court, the public interest requires that doubts be resolved against the nominee. Others see the public interest as embodied in a long-established tradition of affording to those accused of misconduct a presumption of innocence. In cases in which the facts are unclear, they would argue that the question should be resolved in favor of the nominee. In evaluating any given claim of misconduct, we will be ill-served in the long run 
if we abandon the presumption of innocence and fairness, tempting though it may be. We must always remember that it is when passions are the most inflamed that fairness is most in jeopardy. The presumption of innocence is relevant to the advice and consent function when an accusation, now she was, she was careful in the way she phrased this, the presumption of innocence is relevant to the advice and consent function when an accusation departs from a nominee's otherwise exemplary record. I worry that departing from this presumption could lead to a lack of public faith in the judiciary. Now that's interesting. It comes back to this idea of faith in the judiciary, doesn't it? Um, now you may disagree with her on precisely this point. Um, <clears throat> but anyway, continuing the quotation, I worry that departing from this presumption could lead to a lack of public faith in the judiciary and would be hugely damaging to the confirmation process going forward. Mr. President, the Constitution does not provide guidance as to how we were supposed to evaluate these competing claims. Um, this is not a criminal trial. I do, I do not believe that claims such as these need to be proved beyond a reasonable doubt. Nevertheless, fairness would dictate that the claims at least should meet a threshold of quote-unquote more likely than not as our standard. And she goes on to conclude that under the more likely than not standard, um, it, was, it was more likely than not that, that uh, Justice Kavanaugh uh, was telling the truth and that, uh, that his accusers were not. Now, um, uh, again, her, her, I think she focused on the relevant question of what standard the Senate should use when um, assessing allegations of misconduct against judicial nominees. I think one can believe that to be the central question while also disagreeing with her conclusion uh, that the more likely than not standard, what lawyers sometimes call the preponderance of the evidence standard, should apply. Um, indeed, my um, colleague, uh, Lisa Cover, wrote uh, an excellent and very articulate op-ed for the Idaho Statesman um, in which she argued that instead the standard should be significant doubt. Professor Cover argued that when there is significant doubt uh, about whether a nominee engaged in misconduct, the doubt should be resolved against the nominee. Uh, and indeed, I, I do suggest that this is one of those situations in which the relevant standard is often decisive in how one ultimately comes down, assuming one feels oneself bound by the standard. Now, um, I think that this question of what standard should be used uh, actually is itself a multifaceted question. Um, so, so, for example, Senator Collins said, well, this is the standard I would adopt when these accusations uh, seem to me to depart from what's otherwise an exemplary record. So she qualified uh, her, her application of the standard. One might, one might ask what other uh, considerations would be relevant. Um, should the standard apply be affected by the nature of the alleged misconduct? Here we have an allegation of sexual misconduct. Uh, it's an allegation, really, of, of, of violence, essentially. Um, and uh, maybe allegations of sexual misconduct should be judged differently from allegations, say, simply that a person was a heavy drinker uh, when they were in college. Um, uh, and, you know, uh, this, this question itself uh, concerning the relevance of the alleged misconduct, I think, can be further unpacked. Um, should we be influenced by the fact that, that, um, that uh, the, the choice that was made over Justice Kavanaugh uh, could very well have an effect on, on, on uh, the willingness of victims of sexual misconduct to come forward. Um, after all, uh, there is this problem, everyone seems to acknowledge, um, that victims of sexual misconduct are often afraid to come forward because they fear they won't be believed. So should that play in to the way we judge these particular allegations um, against Justice Kavanaugh. I think it could be argued, and I very much welcome your um, thought, our collective thought about this. And I would say on the one hand, um, if one assumes that the allegations are not accurate, um, then he's a victim of the nature of the allegations. Um, but on the other hand, if you, if you take a broader picture and, and leave it in, in, in equipoise, um, maybe the allegations of misconduct do matter. I can say, and I suspect many of you, like me, have been involved in hiring decisions. Um, and isn't it fair to say that we often resolve on, on doubts against the applicant, especially when there are lots of, of qualified applicants? I have to admit that I, I do myself. And then um, uh, one final um, question, and that, the 
I think the Kavanaugh confirmation process raises is does, does the Kavanaugh confirmation raise fundamental questions about existing constitutional um, structures and processes? Um, so, for example, um, the Washington Post ran an article about a week ago or so um, that pointed out a couple of things about Justice Kavanaugh's confirmation. Um, first, that of course the president who uh, selected him uh, was not approved by a majority of the voters. Have less than one. This is making noise. I apologize for that. There's my penguin, darn it. Popped up too soon. I don't want to get to my penguin yet. But I'm there. Okay. Um, when I talk about it, so the Washington Post made the point that not only do we have Kavanaugh uh, selected, appointed by, by someone who did not get uh, the electoral uh, majority of the popular vote, the senators who voted in favor of Kavanaugh represent less than a majority of the American public. Now, um, among other things, so that, that's the Washington Post take on it, kind of characteristic of the Washington Post. So the Wall Street Journal replied today um, in an op-ed um, saying, well, a couple of things. Number one, the Electoral College simply reflects the fact that we're not a pure democracy. This isn't a popularity contest. Um, and that the framers designed the Electoral College um, and um, the representation in the U.S. Senate um, very deliberately to counter popular pressures. Um, and in particular, the composition of the Senate reflects a hard-won compromise uh, that may well have been necessary to reach consensus on the Constitution uh, the, the division then between large states and small states about representation in the uh, legislative body of Congress. Um, and uh, and uh, one of the things, and I, I, I have to mention this just because I'm a con law professor and I board my, my um, students with it, so I'll board you with it, but the only provision in the Constitution that cannot be amended is the provision that gives states two, two, two vote to two senators in the U.S. Senate. You cannot change the basis on which the Senate is represented. Every state gets two senators, and you can't amend that. To change that aspect of the Constitution, you would have to have scrap the whole thing and start again. So the framers obviously felt powerful about it. We could get into a question about to what extent should the intentions of the framer, um, framers uh, control us. But seeing the hour is late, I can start down that road. Instead, I will. Uh, Bring up the penguin and say thank you very much for your attention. I'd love to hear your questions. Oh,